Jan Oberg is the founder of Transnational.Live, who joins us from Lund, Sweden. We also have Gilbert Doctorow, independent international affairs analyst, who joins us from Brussels. Welcome to you both. So, Jan Oberg, I'll start with you. Uh, let's break down this uh, summit that's going to be held in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Gosh, there's so many questions that I can ask you about this. Um, why do you think Jeddah, Saudi Arabia was picked? I wish I knew. Um, it seems to me that it must be a public relation operation somehow because uh, the, one of the main parties are not invited. And if you go to our Saudi Arabian newspapers or international press, there's hardly anybody who knows anything about what this is about. That can be a good idea from a peace negotiation point of view, but I have a hard time believing that this is uh, something that we should focus very much on. You see, one of the th problems is that everybody thinks they know what peace is. As an expert in peace with some decades of experience and also concrete peacemaking, I'm very skeptical to most of these plans. Uh, to tell you the truth, I think the one China has come up with the 12 point plans is by far the best because it establishes values, frameworks, and principles. A peace plan, no matter who, who is ask, uh, promoting it, that says this should be done, this should be done, this should be done, and publicize it somewhere, has no understanding or knowledge. Uh, that person or that country is a peace illiterate country. And of course, peace illiteracy is all over the world. That's why we have all the militarism and the wars. Gilbert, Dr. Al, uh, does it surprise you, the Russian reaction to this, who was not invited? Because Russia could have come out and said, we don't accept anything that comes out of the summit. But it wasn't a clear-cut no. Well, it cost them nothing to say maybe. The, the point is not why this was set up in Saudi Arabia. That's pretty obvious. Uh, Saudi Arabia has good connections with China. Saudi Arabia uh, would appear to be a um, a neutral to slightly friendly uh, venue, friendly to, to the United States' interests. However, the question is, why did they accept? Why did the Saudis accept to be used uh, uh, so uh, cynically by the Americans to try to influence the, uh, the global South? That is, a, that is a really puzzling side of this whole issue, that, pe that countries are now pressing for a peace solution, uh, and particularly the United States, with Jake Sullivan, uh, as, a, as the ringmaster uh, is talking about a peace solution is entirely uh, uh, the result of Ukraine currently losing the war. Uh, and although Washington does everything possible to disguise that fact and to reject that reality, the reality stares everyone in the face and is becoming more obvious as the Russians have moved from defensive to the start of offensive operations in the northeast of, Ukra of Ukraine and Kharkov. Now, the, the, the Ukrainians are losing, and so we have a, a peace conference to discuss the terms of Ukraine's uh, peace settlement, which are based on Ukraine winning the war and Russia losing the war. It's really <laughs> upside down. So uh, when we talk about the war here, Jan Oberg, in terms of who's winning and who's losing, um, so we're looking at over 500 days. I forget exactly how many days. But at what point would you say there was any progress that was made by Ukraine? I mean, let's put it this way. Um, if somebody didn't know there was a war, but looked at Ukraine and then looked at Moscow, I think the uh, conclusion they would have made is Ukraine has lost. And that ter territory is decimated in some areas. So why did the, uh, the US prolong, I don't want to say prolong the war, uh, assisted U.S. militarily without there being notable achievements? Was it because they hoped that Ukraine would be able to win the war? But you would think that after the first, second, third, fourth, fifth try, uh, try of military assistance that, that, that this just wouldn't happen. Well, long story short, the Vilnius meeting of NATO clearly said we have dropped you as a NATO member in the future. Ukraine has been promised the last 15 years and it's not going to happen. And that, I suppose, was the consequence of the fact that uh, I think President Biden's, if we make it, it will mean a world war. So what you do instead is you say, we will support you militarily and in other ways for as long as it takes. The fact is that NATO slash U.S. 
that now have been lost or they have withdrawn from it like Afghanistan and now they are going to do the same with Ukraine. Uh, the problem is at the moment that everybody thinks that war is the only plan in all the towns, whether Moscow, Brussels, Washington. And uh, my simple point is at some point uh, one or more of the parties will be exhausted, but the human cost will be absolutely terrible. If you have seen the left from Kiev universities, 78% of the Ukrainian people know somebody, uh, up to seven members of close friends, either armed or died. But right. something terrible, fortunately, will probably run for a long time because the West cannot say we made a mistake with NATO's expansion. All right. Um, the other thing that's perplexing about this whole uh, affair, uh, I don't know if you agree or not, Gobo Dr. Al, is the fact that if there is going to be some kind of uh, peace initiative that may result in, in one, um, there's still the fact that you have NATO uh, on the borders uh, of uh, Russia. You still have the fact that you have Joseph Burrell that came out and said uh, for the next five years uh, to the tune of, uh, I forget the figure, uh, military assistance will be given to Ukraine just in case. Uh, so you still have that hanging over any peace accord that may come out of that. Um, how, how does that look from the Russian point of view? Well, I don't think the Russians listen to Mr. Burrell very much. And the question of uh, how NATO has improved itself, how it's expanded as a result of this war, particularly in Scandinavia and the Finnish adhesion to NATO, is, again, a propaganda line, which very few people have stood up and questioned. The extension, for example, of NATO's frontiers with Russia by of more than a thousand kilometers in the Finnish-Russian border is not strengthening NATO. On the contrary, it's weakening NATO in the same way that the adhesion of the three Baltic states were a net negative for NATO because they could be overrun in three days by, by Russian troops and everyone knew that. The, if uh, Ukraine with uh, 35, 38 million uh, inhabitants and one, uh, perhaps the strongest army in, in Western Europe uh, was unable to, re to stand up successfully to Russia, then how is, how is uh, Finland, with what, 8 million people, uh, going to uphold an, a border of equal length against the same Russian people? They, uh, you have to just stop for a minute and ask whether any of the lines coming out of Washington make sense. They don't. They assume an audience that is supine or is indifferent or is idiotic. And those are very bad assumptions. How optimistic or pessimistic are you, Jan Oberg, for any type of peace settlement to come, whether it's from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, or uh, in the near future? I'm of the opinion that way before the war broke out, uh, that the only ones who have the global experience, uh, the long-term training and education for these types of operations is the United Nations. Put down 200,000 people. Uh, Disarm everybody, get some calm in the place, do peacekeeping, get somebody to do secret diplomacy with all the parties involved, and that means East and West, and China and others, and of course Ukraine, and see to it that you use the experience from former Yugoslavia, because there are lots of parallels with the problematic of Donetsk and uh, what you happen in, in have to have happen to have in Croatia, uh, Ukraine. Remember, it means border areas. This is the kind of thing of minorities inside minorities and complications and international law and special autonomies and all that. The only ones who can do that is not Saudi Arabia. It's not the U.S. It's not those who are parties to the conflict. I know everybody thinks the UN is useless. It is not. If we make it to do it, that it's the only organization we have, and the Charter is the best document humanity has for solving these problems. Okay, we're going to unfortunately have to end it there, just uh, out of time. Jan Oberg, thank you, founder Transnational.live from Lund, Sweden, Gilbert Doctorow, independent international affairs analyst from Brussels. Thank you to you both. And with that, we come to an end for this news review.